Today's episode of The Overwhelmed Brain is brought to you by Casper. You got to try this mattress. Go to casper.com forward slash brain and get $50 off your order. Make sure to use the promo code brain when checking out. Oh, sounds so comfortable. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you even more annoyed by that one person in your social circles that always says things like, Think positively! There's nothing wrong in the world! And even sickness and death have a silver lining! <gasps> yeah, that's great and all, Peter, but can you at least wait till after the funeral before spreading your invasive optimism? <laughs> You're such a downer! I'll go sit down and try not to laugh during the eulogy. After all, wouldn't want everyone to be in a good mood. That might spoil the misery. Gee whiz. If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like a straight path to denial, then you're in the right place to start creating the life you want now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, personal empowerment coach and host of The Overwhelmed Brain. And this is the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On every episode, we'll talk about practical down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason, causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. Everything I talk about in this show should not be mistaken for actual medical advice or treatment and is intended to be for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your medical treatment. What you will find here is an increase in your emotional intelligence, a strengthening of your self-worth and self-esteem, the motivation to be your authentic self, and the forward momentum to help you learn, heal, grow, and evolve. All right, the first thing I want to talk about today is the formula that makes up a friendship. And the reason I want to talk about this is because my girlfriend and her friend were talking about what brings them together and how you can go out and make friends and how you know it's a good friendship and what actually creates a friendship and keeps it uh, lasting. And, you know, because you can look at something and go, well, we like the same thing, so we're friends. And uh, I decided to dig into that a little deeper because throughout the years, I've been myself very selective of who can be in my close circle of friends, who I actually call a friend. Because what happens or what has happened in the past is that I'll have these uh, close friends that turn out to be not close, but were based on some sort of dysfunction in me. And I hate to say this <laughs> because I've had some good friends in the past, uh, but we just weren't a match overall. For example, you have a friend and you go, well, we met under these circumstances and we like these same things and we talk about these same things. Yet when I was a people pleaser, I would have more friends than I wanted. I would make friends with people and keep those friendships based on a dysfunction in me. So technically it was unfair for them because they thought they had this authentic friendship, yet I would keep friendships that only lasted out of my necessity to uh, keep the peace or please other people. And when you do that, when you have friendships that are based on some sort of dysfunctional need in you, and then you heal from that dysfunctional need, or even before you heal, but typically after you heal from that dysfunctional need, you no longer need the friend. And I hate to say it that way because, you know, friendships are supposed to last. But if you've based it on something that you uh, really need in yourself and you no longer need that, then that friendship kind of wanes. But like I said, even before you heal, like when I was a people pleaser, I would make friends in my life and eventually get burnt out because I found myself doing whatever I could to please my friends. And then I felt ungrateful because they wouldn't people please back. And I would build resentment and even anger that um, they're not doing anything in reciprocation. I felt like I was always giving and giving and they just took. But for the most part, these friends weren't really takers in a dysfunctional way. They just came to know me as that person 
and continue to enjoy the friendship with that extra quality about me. So I would give and give, and oh, Paul's a nice guy. He's He does this for me. He does that for me. Uh, but they probably don't even think twice that it's a bad thing. They just appreciate the friendship, and they just know me as someone who does a lot for them or in general for a lot of people. So friendships can certainly start uh, with a dysfunction like that, but they can also start uh, based on other criteria, which I've decided to look at my past friendships, the ones that actually meant something to me, the ones that um, when they existed in my life, I decided to ask myself, what about those friendships were special and so, and why did they last so long and what kept us together when it wasn't a dysfunction or only a dysfunction? Because you know, there's all kinds of reasons to get together. So I wanted to create this segment talking about friendships just to share with you my thoughts on this subject matter. So let's begin and I'll tell you why I think true, authentic, long-lasting friendships are formed and why they last. Are you ready? <laughs> so I have a bullet list here I'm going to go through. The first thing is uh, the freedom to be yourself. I remember when I was a teenager, uh, still going to high school, I had a couple really good friends. And we would, I mean, we would be silly and stupid. <laughs> we would laugh a lot and we would talk a lot and we would hang out at each other's houses and sleep over each other's houses and we would just have a great time. Uh, and no matter what, we always wanted to spend time together. And so the freedom to be yourself, I think, is an important quality of friendship. Like I remember, I don't know, laughing all night doing stupid things with uh, my friend Doug. I had rented a video camera and for the first time we were on film. I mean, nowadays you could put yourself on film on an iPhone and then it's no big deal. <laughs> But back then, it felt like you were on TV, like you were on a movie. So we set up the camera, and we were doing all kinds of silly things on the camera. And we were just laughing our butts off. And him and I were good friends for years. And we had a lot of similar hobbies and things like that. And we'll get to some other qualities. But um, the freedom to be yourself, that's what I felt with my friends, uh, both Doug and another friend of mine, Pat. We just felt free to be ourselves. And it, there was there were no restrictions on who we could be. We could just be silly and make faces and do anything we want. And by the end of the night, we're still best friends. The next quality of a friendship that I've uh, learned over the years is that when you share stresses and or successes. For example, when I worked for a uh, phone company, uh, the senior to me, his name was Mark, really good guy and really good friend, I always felt was a little smarter than me. <laughs> And I looked up to that. Uh, he was at the company first, so I walked in, and he was my mentor in a lot of ways. He taught me a lot about phone systems and technology, and but he, he was always ahead of me in so many ways. No matter how much I learned, he learned more, and um, I liked that. I really liked that about Mark, and um, you know, amongst other things. But we worked for the same company, and in that company, there was you know some political stuff and some other people that maybe we did or didn't like, or maybe one person that we didn't get along with. And we can share stories about that. And working for the same company gave us a lot of that um, shared stress and shared success. Like we'd put in a phone system, we'd reach the end of the night, 2 a.m. sometimes, maybe longer. And we'd be like, yes, we did it. It works. Everything's good. And we just felt this shared success. And of course, when a customer is complaining and he goes out there and then I go out there and then I call him and I'm telling him, you know, this customer's complaining about this. And he goes, man, I know how you feel. <laughs> and so suddenly I have a, a partner out there that's uh, really relating to me and uh, rooting me on. And he knows he's been there. He's been there. So it, it really helps ease my stress or tension, even though I still have to deal with it. But at least he's been through it and he knows what this customer's like. So these shared stresses and successes are another quality of uh, what makes up a friendship. What's another one? Uh, I have already sort of addressed this, but shared laughter. Now, when you can find someone that has the same sense of humor as you, that can sometimes be a huge, huge quality of a friendship. Uh, for example, uh, my friend John and I went to an expo and we spent uh, a couple nights in a hotel room. And... I think I told this on the show before, but um, 
I was imitating a character on a movie and I just kept saying the same things over and over again in his voice and we were both cracking up and I could do it over and over and over again and we would both laugh just as hard. And no matter what I found funny, he also found funny. And there were many other qualities of our friendship, but I do remember that we just laughed a lot. So that's, that's very similar to the freedom to be yourself. But I do believe that shared laughter, when you both have a very similar sense of humor, is a, a really good quality to have in a friendship. And of course, in a relationship too. But I'm focused on friendships right now. And uh, a lot of this does cross-pollinate into romantic relationships too. But let's go on to the next one, which is um, shared philosophies or religion or beliefs. I tell you what, that can strengthen a bond and create a high quality, long lasting relationships. If you go to a church or you meet up with people once a week or several times a week or whenever that have the same philosophies or values or beliefs, then you almost both share a bigger vision. And maybe that, maybe that's what I should call this, a shared bigger vision of uh, yourself, your path, your, um, your life plan, whatever it is. I mean, we all have very specific things that we want to do in our life. But when you have that bigger vision that's always guiding you, that beacon that's way out in the distance, when that's shared, that can typically bring camaraderie and, and bonding and really be the glue that holds you together. Even if you have like way off uh, specific things that you are not even remotely in common, <laughs> you know, like one of you is super wealthy and the other one's really poor. Or one of you has a car and the other one rides a bike. I mean, that's a terrible example. <laughs> one of you is really confident in yourself and the other one's really nervous or something like that. When, when, even when there's extreme unlikenesses, that bigger vision can sometimes bring people together and keep your friendship close-knit as you follow the bigger plan for your life or that bigger vision. Uh, another thing is uh, shared hobbies. This one's pretty obvious. You get into a hobby or you're doing something recreational or fun and other people are doing that same thing friendships can develop uh, in that way too heck when i was um a teenager and i started skateboarding friends were so easy to make you meet other skateboarders they're trying the same tricks they're trying to do exactly what you're trying to do some of them are better than you some of them aren't so good and they're trying and they look up to you you look up to others when you have a group like that when there are varying degrees of skill and all these personalities, it doesn't matter what their backgrounds are. You just gravitate towards each other. It's like you understand each other. And it's right along those same lines of a shared success and a shared stress. Like, oh, I can't land this trick. Or, oh, security guard keeps chasing me out. <laughs> it's the same idea. You share very common things, but um, because it's also your hobby, that usually increases uh, bonding as well. Now here's a quality that I've learned more recently in the past few years is that when you have a deeper connection with yourself, when you're into personal growth and evolving your own mind and mental state and emotions and just doing what you can to improve yourself, you're usually friends with those who are along the same path, those who have a deeper connection with themselves. And um, one of my friends uh, is also a podcaster. His name is Matthew. I met him after I appeared on his show. And um, I really enjoyed our conversation. He was very much along the same lines as me as far as uh, putting a message out there of personal growth. And um, even though he was younger than me, I felt he was very wise for his age. And I only compared it to when I was that age. I think he's 30-something and I'm 46 so I looked at him and I go, wow, I wish I had known what he knows when I was that age. And I respected him even more when he told me how um, he communicates with his family, uh, how healthy his relationships are, and how uh, he keeps toxic people out of his life, or at least at a distance. And I found very, a lot of similarities in that respect. And like I said, I, I really appreciated the deep connection he had with himself. Because that's how I feel. I, I feel like I have a deeper connection with myself than some of the people that I meet, which is why I can't connect with them. It's hard to explain unless you actually do feel a deeper connection with yourself. 
And all I mean by that is, is if you're doing any type of self-improvement, then you have a deeper connection with yourself. So it can often uh, spring up uh, good friendships when you uh, reach out and connect with other people that have a deeper connection with themselves. Because you have a bigger goal for yourself. You're not just going to stay stagnant in your life. You actually want to improve how your life turns out and where you end up and improve who you are in every way. And that can be a struggle. That can sometimes be hard to do because you might have some emotional wounds to heal. And healing those emotional wounds does have its trials and tribulations. So meeting someone else who is also going through those motions, healing their emotional wounds and getting to a better place in themselves can totally relate to you. And one of the things I really liked about uh, my friend Matthew that I just talked about is uh, the next quality of a good friendship, which is when the masculine and feminine energy uh, complement each other in the sense that uh, my, this is an opinion that I came up with that um, I haven't run a poll or a scientific study about. <laughs> but in my life and in a lot of friends that I've seen that are really good friends, my belief is that friends typically share more of one aspect and romantic friends or lovers typically complement in the opposite. Let me explain. <laughs> when it comes to what you embrace more of in yourself, I mean, we both have the masculine energy and the feminine energy in ourselves. And when you embrace more of one over the other, you're more likely to have friends that embrace that same one that you embrace. So if you have a very feminine energy about you, you're more likely to have friends that embrace more of the feminine in them. When you have that masculine, same thing. You're more likely to embrace friends that have more of the masculine in them, which would explain why I had a lot of female friends that embraced more of the feminine in them because most of my life I've embraced more of the feminine, more of the, the soft and nurturing and receptive side of myself. And as I healed from some old uh, emotional wounds, I started embracing more of the masculine in me. I mean, I hadn't experienced much of the masculine in most of my life. And when I started experiencing that masculine energy, I found myself making friends with people who embraced their masculine energy. It doesn't mean they were only masculine. It just means that the aspect that they embraced more of was masculine. So again, this is just an opinion, but look at your own friends. Do your good and close friends match you in the, the energy that you put out? Are you more masculine? Are you more feminine? And what about your friends? Are they more masculine? Are they more feminine? There may be exceptions to this, of course, but I found that in my case and uh, other friends who have other friends, this seems to be true more than not. Now, on the flip side, when you have a romantic relationship, I found that when you have a masculine energy about you, or at least that's what you embrace more of in you, you're typically attracted to people that have a more feminine aspect about them. And the same in reverse. When you embrace more of the feminine, you're attracted to more of the masculine. This even works in same-sex relationships because uh, you'll often see one is more feminine and one is more masculine. Again, there are exceptions, I'm sure, but um, from what I've seen, there, there does seem to be in romantic relationships that, that yin-yang uh, complementary aspect of a couple. And so I find that uh, fascinating because uh, one of the qualities that I liked about Matthew is that he seemed very balanced in his masculine and feminine energy. He was okay connecting with himself, connecting with his emotions, and um, really talking about himself in a deep way, but also comfortable being masculine too. And I feel that way myself. I feel like I embrace the masculine in me, and it can come out even more when I need it. But I also have no problem embracing that feminine side of me as well, and talking about emotions, and being romantic, and being sensitive. I mean, there are probably many interpretations of what is actually masculine and what is actually feminine, but we'll discuss that on another day. <laughs> but the uh, idea that uh, I found that he seems to be balanced in between and I seem to be balanced in between, we just clicked. We got along great. And I find that the friends that I make usually have a good balance because I feel like there's a good balance in me. And, and not that that's any better or worse 
than embracing one aspect over another. It's just where you are and uh, where your friends are that, that seem to complement each other. Now, another thing about um, the quality of a friendship or the formula for a friendship is that, and this is one of my favorites, friends represent aspects of ourselves that we either like or want to have more of. For example, my friend Mark that I mentioned earlier, like I said, I felt he was a little smarter than me and I wanted his skills and his ability, especially to stay calm with upset people. He would have no problem. When someone was upset, he just stayed so calm. I really appreciated that. I really looked up to that uh, quality in him and I wanted to be more like him in that respect. That was a, um, an aspect of myself that I wanted to have more of or improve. I had another good friend, uh, Steve, that I, I worked with him and he had excellent leadership skills. And I totally soaked that in because I didn't. <laughs> At the time, I was a, an assistant manager. He was a manager. And um, it came to a point where someone had to get fired. Someone had to get terminated. And I was nervous as hell. <laughs> and I told Steve, I was like, I don't think I can do it. And he said, all right, just um, stay in the office and watch me do it. And I'm like, wow, he's so confident. I, I felt bad because I would be like, changing someone's life but Steve had some solid leadership skills that I think he got uh, from years in the military and he was also kind and compassionate and he showed many qualities that I absolutely respected and appreciated and wanted more of I mean back then I was more in touch with my feminine side I, I had trouble embracing the masculine take action leadership role that I so wanted to have inside of me but I didn't so I I definitely um, bonded with Steve in a lot of ways because he just showed me my potential or the potential that I wanted to believe that I could attain. And Steve and I were friends for years. And um, I did learn a lot from him and, and he was one of the uh, pivotal people in my life. And speaking of people that you learn a lot from, this leads to um, the second to last component for the formula of a friendship. And this is a quote by Jim Rohn who said, you are the average of the five people you hang around with most. I love this quote because uh, if you think about it, who are you closest to and who do you hang out with most? Are they always broke? And do you have money issues? <laughs> uh, you're more likely to be broke if you hang out with broke people. No judgment there. I'm just saying that can happen more often than not. If you hang out with pessimistic people, you're more likely going to be pessimistic. If you hang out with people that have relationship issues, well, the possibility exists that you might have relationship issues too, though that's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> but the idea is that uh, the people who influence you most, the ones you are around the most, the ones you are closest to most, is typically how you will live your life too. But I'd like to modify that quote a bit to be more of a... Um, I hate to say affirmation <laughs> or a declaration. How about that? We'll use the term declaration. Uh, I would like to modify it to say this. You can improve who you are and how you feel by hanging out only with those that support who you are and how you want to feel. In other words, in the context of that um, declaration, the best kind of friendship involves those people that lift you up, support your path, and encourage you to be true to yourself. I think if you look at your friends now and evaluate them against that declaration, and if they're in alignment with that declaration, then you have some pretty damn good friends. <laughs> if not, eh, you may want to question that. And of course, the Jim Rohn quote, you're the average of the five people you hang out with most. You may want to look at your friends there. And if they're in good places um, and you respect them and maybe even look up to them, then great. Sounds like you have some good friendships. If they're always having trouble, they're pessimistic, and they're not in a place in life that you want to be, I'm not saying get rid of them. I'm just saying they're influencing you. I'm saying that even family does this. If you're close to family members and they're not in a place that you want to be, you just have to be careful of their influence. If you're not affected at all and your life's going great and your friends' lives maybe aren't that great, but as long as you're not affected, then that's okay too. But you just have to be aware that uh, everyone that you're with 
especially those who are closest to you, are and can be a heavy influence. And so let's get to the last quality of friendship. And um, this is another take that uh, represents aspects of ourselves that uh, we either like or want to have more of. And um, those aspects can actually be seen in good stories, like in books, movies, or TV shows, by the characters and their personalities. So, you know, before I talked about aspect of your personality being masculine or feminine, but let's look at the aspects of personality in a story. For example, if you've ever watched Star Trek, The Next Generation, then you're, you're totally going to vibe <laughs> with what I'm about to say. If you haven't, I'll do my best to explain these characters. First, you have a captain who is a strong leader. He rarely lets his emotions uh, control his decisions, and he'll take a bullet or a laser <laughs> for you. He will put himself in harm's way for you and the crew. So you have that. Then you have Deanna, who is empathetic. and She's actually called an empath on the show. She's nurturing. She's supportive. She's caring. She's very, very feminine energy. And um, either that's an aspect of you or an aspect of someone that you appreciate in your life. And then you have Worf, who's strong and brave and honorable and he'll die for what he believes in. That could be an aspect of you, or someone you appreciate or look up to in someone else. Or you might even be offended by that in someone else. For me, for the longest time, I was offended by that, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then there's um, Data, who's logical, rational, uh, even caring, even though he's an android on the show, but he's trying to always better himself. So you might know someone like that. Or that might be a part of you. Then you have Riker, who's another very strong leader, very much captain material, but he can also be playful and romantic and funny and he's fair. Uh, he's also stubborn and relentless. <laughs> so all of these people can represent aspects of the personalities that we might want in our friends. Either because A, we have aspects of their personality and we like the similarities in them, or B, we don't have those aspects of that personality and we want more of their aspects, their personality in our life. We want to improve that in us. So this can happen in many friendships where a friend of ours uh, acts a certain way or has an aspect of their personality that we really appreciate, that we really respect. It's sort of like when I was in a relationship in Florida. One aspect of my girlfriend's personality was that she was very strong-willed and didn't take any BS. And me at that time had quite the opposite. <laughs> I was a people pleaser, like I said, and I was not strong-willed at all. And if someone gave me BS, I would acquiesce. I would submit, okay, I'm sorry. And I was, uh, I, I was considered very, I was very boyish. I was very much a little boy. But she had this strong masculine energy that I definitely appreciated and, and felt like I needed in my life. So I appreciated that about her and I wanted more of that. So she was in my life. Now, she also wanted me to be to embrace my masculine side, but I never did. And uh, the relationship failed for that and other reasons too. But that's a good example of uh, something that you may not have in yourself or may not have enough of in yourself and want to experience it from someone else. It's kind of like filling the gaps, which is what sometimes our friends do. They fill the gaps of what we want more of in ourselves. And uh, I've noticed that shows or stories that are more successful usually have aspects of our personality that we appreciate or want to improve upon. Heck, even the um, Star Trek character Barkley. Again, if you don't know Star Trek, <laughs> none of this makes any sense, but just pretend. <laughs> The, there's a bumbling yet um, humble, uh, yet can't seem to find his own confidence character named Barkley on Star Trek The Next Generation, which can be an aspect of our own personality that w we might not like, or maybe we do like, I don't know. But the idea is that um, even characters that you don't like on TV might represent a part of you that you don't like. And that's just um, a philosophical way to watch a show and see someone's personality and go, hmm. I like that personality. I would like to have a friendship with that person with that personality. I don't like that personality. And then you can ask yourself, um, what about that personality don't I like? Oh, I don't like it in me. I don't like it when I act that way. 
Hmm, that might be something to look at. <laughs> or not. So there's my take on the formula that makes up a friendship. It's it's definitely not an all-inclusive list. <laughs> there's there's a, a million other things. Uh, there's certainly, um, you can read body language. Even uh, how someone smells uh, might be an attractor in friendships. So there's, like I said, there's so many other aspects of it. But I believe this is a good start to understanding maybe your own friendships. Maybe why you have more friends or less friends or certain friends. Look at your friends and try to understand why they're in your life and why you enjoy spending time with them. If you do, maybe you have friends like I discovered in my life that uh, don't provide what they used to provide for you. Like I said, when I started some emotional healing, I chose to stray away from some friends because they no longer provided the function that I gave them. They were completely innocent, <laughs> but I gave them a function because of my dysfunction, if that makes any sense. If I was a people pleaser and someone came along and they were happy when I did things for them, that fulfilled a dysfunction in me and made me feel happy. Yet I grew tired of that and my friendships started to fizzle out because I chose not to be my true self, because I chose not to be authentic and um, say and express what I really wanted because I feared that they would leave me. If my friends leave me, then I'll be alone, and on and on and on. And that's when you make choices and decisions out of a place of fear, instead of a place of confidence and being comfortable in your own skin. So there's the list. I hope that helps if you've had any question of why your friends are your friends, or why your friends aren't your friends. Now you have something to refer to <laughs> when a friendship works or it doesn't. Anyway, let's get to our next segment called Ask Paul. We'll be right back. Talk to you in a minute. All right, if you haven't heard about Casper, you must already be getting a great night's sleep. And I wouldn't mention them if I didn't believe they were going to make your night even more comfortable at a price that was extremely reasonable. Much more reasonable than perhaps uh, a life savings that you might have used on your last mattress. <laughs> Casper is one of those companies that comes along that simply delivers. And I mean that in every possible way. Because when you buy a Casper mattress, not only do you get free delivery, but, and this is my favorite but in the world, <laughs> they'll pick it up for free if you're not completely satisfied within a hundred days. That's right, if you're in the US or Canada, take advantage of their free delivery and pickup if you're not completely satisfied. Though, you won't need to use their free pickup because you're going to love this mattress. Casper mattresses are obsessively engineered at a price that you won't believe. Casper is a sleep brand that creates one perfect mattress sold directly to consumers. That means no middleman. When my girlfriend and I were shopping couches just a few weeks ago, we learned that every store had different prices for very similar couches. The smaller stores seemed to have better prices than the larger ones that had more employees and showrooms, and they looked out of this world. So we learned the upcharge on some of these couches were insane. But we were shopping showrooms that have to pay employees and massive rent and strip malls and such. Casper takes out that middleman and passes the savings on to you. They deliver a springy and comfortable memory foam mattress that I'm sure you're going to love. Sleep on a Casper mattress for 100 nights risk-free in your own home by going to casper.com forward slash brain and select the size mattress that you need today. Enjoy a sleep surface that's got just the right sink and just the right bounce. And its breathable design helps cool you to regulate your temperature throughout the night. And did I mention risk-free? <laughs> If you've been thinking about buying a new mattress and were worried about the commitment, take that worry out right now by visiting casper.com forward slash brain. And just to make it a bit more enticing, as if it wasn't already enough to buy one now, use the promo code brain during checkout and you'll get $50 off your purchase. Now that right there will help you sleep a lot better. Go to casper.com forward slash brain and use the promo code brain for $50 off during checkout. Check out their selection today. All 
All right, welcome back. This is Ask Paul. This is where I read a listener email on the air and do my best to help them through a challenge. Uh, today's message comes from someone that wrote me an email a couple months back, actually, and it's been sitting in my inbox uh, waiting for translation. <laughs> and um, the reason I say that is because it, it's kind of all over the place. The guy, I'll call him John, says that um, he's been with his wife for a long time, but uh, she cheated on him. And this uh, cheating has been plaguing him for I don't know how long. Like I said, the email was sort of all over the place and repeated a few times uh, things that happened and how much um, love they have for each other and how much love he's getting from her. But he's still plagued with these thoughts that she might uh, or she had cheated and why would she do such a thing? And um, he's wondering if she's going to cheat again because he's starting to get that uh, suspicious feeling. So I'm not going to read you the email just because of the you know, what I said already that uh, it's a little hard to follow. But I did get the basic message and where he was going, which is I'm lost. I don't know what to do. I'm in this situation, this relationship, and um, I have these thoughts and these feelings and these suspicions. And if you've listened to my show, you've probably heard me talk about you know, infidelity before. It is a very touchy subject. I have my own personal bias <laughs> that I don't usually include uh, in infidelity because we all handle it differently. For me, if someone betrays me, they are out of my life. That is my own personal uh, bias, my own personal opinion, because I must have a low toleration point for lying or dishonesty or something. I haven't really explored it too much, but all it takes for me is once. But that's not because I don't uh, still love the person or uh, still even like the person. It's not that at all. It's because I know that my thoughts will always go back to, what if it happens again? What if it happens again? And whether it does or not, I'll be suspicious. I'll be sneaky. I'll be looking at her, maybe her emails or I'll be wondering where she is all the time. I'll, I'll just be asking myself questions and I'll be driving myself crazy. And I'd, I'd rather not put myself through it. But other people, they're more resilient than I am. Other people are probably more, I don't know, forgiving than I am, I'll, I have to admit. So if you're in a situation where your partner has cheated on you and you decided to stick around and make it work, I applaud you. I, in a way, envy you because you must see more in the other person than maybe I would see in the other person. So that's just a personal admittance and a, a personal opinion that um, no one should follow. <laughs> you should not follow my lead on that because everyone's different. Every situation is different. I am more of a um, take action kind of guy uh, in the sense that if it happens once, I have a, a boundary that, that breaks my boundary. And once it breaks my boundary, it's, it's done. Now, it's not to say in a couple of years, uh, after something like that happened, I might, both of us might have grown and learned from a lot of stuff and maybe come back together. But boy, in the moment, mm, it's pretty much over for me. Now, I don't teach that. I don't teach you to make it over for you. What I teach is that if you both really want to make it work and the person who cheated really does not want to cheat again, really does feel like what they did was a mistake and a heat of the moment thing and there were maybe trouble in the relationship or not. I mean, I've heard from people where they said there was no trouble in my relationship. I still cheated and I don't know why. And you could look at that in many ways. There's always uh, something about someone that you might find attractive and maybe you're not supposed to. <laughs> and you get attracted more and more to that person. And even though you're in a relationship, you can't fight it off. And if they have an attraction for you too, then it's even harder because now the magnetivity is working both ways. The attraction is going both ways and it gets harder and harder, harder to resist. If I ever find myself in that situation, I take myself out of that situation. <laughs> I've talked about that before in this show. Like I take myself out of situations where I know that the attraction is too strong. I haven't felt that in a few years, but when I was married, I felt that once and I was like, whoa, the attraction's too strong here. I got to take myself out. 
And that could just be hardwiring. That could be our bodies responding to someone else's bodies. Maybe it's their smell, the way they look, the way they talk. Maybe there's a perfect formula for what we find attractive because we were hardwired that way. So that's normal. It's like if you catch your guy or you catch your girl looking at someone else, that's normal. That's that's okay. They can look at someone else. This is what I believe we're wired to do. We see someone else, we look at someone else, we go, wow, that's attractive. And then we move on. We don't make an, an obsession. We don't follow anyone around and we don't pursue it further. We stay with who we're with, hopefully. If we don't stay with who we're with, then betrayal happens and hurt feelings and the spiral of misery starts and people get hurt. So it's, it gets hard to recover from something like that. But let me come back to this letter where uh, this person was definitely hurt, but wants to uh, continue the relationship and heal because he knows he has something good. And when that happens, and when you're both into it, it absolutely can work. I've worked with couples where infidelity played a part and they both wanted to work it out and it worked out great. I've seen this over and over again. And in fact, the couples that wanted to work it out, when they were both absolutely willing to go forward with it, it usually made their relationship better. Now, in a percentage of uh, couples where there's infidelity, when you find that someone has been unfaithful uh, more than once or several times and has lied about it continuously for months or years, that's more challenging. The, um, the term once a cheater, always a cheater comes to mind. And I'm not saying that because it's true. I'm saying that because it needs to be considered that someone who's been lying or cheating for a long time may not necessarily be able to stop that behavior. I'm not saying it's not possible, <laughs> but usually that behavior continues. It's just that they find ways to do it uh, and more pain might come from it. So, you know, everything I talk about, there's always exceptions, but it's just something to think about. So again, about this letter, that I received, uh, his wife cheated on him and he, uh, they went through a period of patching things up and healing, but now he's having these suspicions again. He, uh, thinks that she might be getting in touch with this person again. And she's coming home late, uh, and randomly and saying that she's in one place when he believes maybe she's not in that one place. She's somewhere else. And um, I wanted to address this aspect of infidelity or deception or lies or things like that. And the aspect is when your mind is occupied with these things that don't feel right and you're suspicious, and then you try to get uh, validation or justification for your beliefs or your uh, perceptions, but you don't feel fully justified, like you didn't get the best answer that you could, or you didn't find out the information that made you feel better, I think that's a warning sign. I think that's one of those yellow flags that you should be aware of. Now, this isn't, this isn't just a one-off thing. Like, she came home late one night, and ever since that one night, she hasn't done it again. But that one night, I'm suspicious. You know, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily call that a warning flag. Maybe you didn't get a good answer about where she was, and you just have these suspicions. I wouldn't, I mean, that could be a number of things, but it may not be a warning flag. But if you get repetitive warning flags where, oh, she's late again, or he's late again, or who was that on the phone? Oh, they won't really talk about who was on the phone, or they do, but it just doesn't seem like a valid answer. When those happen more and more and more, there's a pattern. And I want you to start trusting yourself when you sense these patterns. And this is where I'm going with this. When you have these patterns in your life and something doesn't seem right the first time and then something doesn't seem right the second time and the third time and the fourth time, there's a pattern emerging and you're not going crazy, but this is how you go crazy because you see these patterns and you try to write them off in your mind. You try to validate them. Well, she must just be talking a little bit longer than normal with her sister. He must be later than normal because he there's a lot of traffic and the roads are icy and, and all of these things may be true. But 
when those events are rare and they're not part of a bigger pattern or trend, then you don't really have to think about it too much. It kind of goes away and maybe it doesn't really come back to your thoughts. But when it happens again or something different happens or something similar happens, you just get these feelings like there's something wrong. And I've seen this in um, manipulative relationships where there'll be a manipulative person in the relationship and the person who's being manipulated senses something but just can't quite get the good feeling back by um, finding justification for their actions. And they never get their suspicions invalidated, so to speak, where it shows that they're, that the other person's not really being deceptive. It just never happens. They never get full closure on anything. And that's where crazy making starts. You just feel like you're going crazy. Like, I, I know there's something there, but I just can't quite put my finger on it. Well, they were 15 minutes late tonight, and they seem to have a valid excuse, but then they were 15 minutes late the next week on the same night, and uh, they had another valid excuse, and something just isn't right. I'm telling you, it's okay to put up those yellow warning flags. I call them yellow. You know, you have a green flag, like, hey, it's okay. <laughs> then you have a yellow flag, just like a stoplight in America. I don't know if stoplights are the same everywhere. <laughs> but then you have um, the red flags. And the red flags are the absolutely, this is a problem. This is a warning sign. So these yellow flags come up and they, they create a trend. And you go, okay, has the trend been this way? And then you ask yourself, have I, have I found any closure in my suspicions, like, oh, he was 15 minutes later and he, he said that he was talking to his brother in the car at work and uh, I just don't know. And then you find out uh, a few weeks later that his brother said, oh, yeah, your uh, husband and I were talking in the car after work one day and we were talking about this and this and this. And then suddenly you feel closure, like, oh, that suspicion I had uh, wasn't valid. That's good. I feel better. And if that was a one-off thing, great. You don't even have to worry about it anymore. You, you found closure. But if it was part of a, a trend, you might need more than just that one issue closed. And you have, to, you have to be aware of these trends, especially if something happened in the past. Like someone who's been betrayed, someone who's been cheated on, should have that tiny little warning system in, their, in the back of their mind. They're, it's not that I want you to live in paranoia, especially if you've come to build a new trust with the person you're with, because I honestly believe that when you're with someone, that you should just put your full love and trust and support in them until they show you a reason to do otherwise. Because if you don't, how can you expand the relationship into the best it could possibly be if you don't give that full love, trust, and support? And unfortunately, after a betrayal you might have to spend a long time re-earning that if you're the one who betrayed. And if that's the case, then you can't afford yellow flags. <laughs> you aren't given the luxury of leeway. <laughs> you have a, a very small window where you are allowed error. <laughs> so you have to be careful. If you're the one who has done any type of betrayal, manipulation, cheating, infidelity, all that stuff that uh, really gives a blow to a relationship and you want to uh, make things good again, you might have to spend a year or more being the perfect, obedient partner <laughs> because that's what it might take to rebuild that trust. And hopefully you've also done some healing around what happened. The one who cheated and the one who got cheated on have uh, some emotional wounds that they need to heal from. Because if the cheater brought some old emotional wounds into the relationship and found it uh, necessary or hard to resist uh, cheating, then that person might be carrying around some old emotional wounds or at least some old programming that it was okay to do that. Or they may need to work on resistance or at least honoring themselves and getting out of the relationship they're in before they seek someone else. Not that I encourage you to do that, but I would rather have you do that than be in a relationship and uh, betray the trust of that relationship. And then the victim of the betrayal. There's probably going to be a lot more of the, that emotional wounding in that person. And uh, that needs to be healed and 
You might need therapy. You might need to talk to someone. You, you definitely need to talk to each other and have a more open, very honest communication with each other so that uh, all of this is out on the table and you can work with it. So important that everything's out on the table so you can work with it. And don't keep this stuff buried inside of you thinking that it's better to just keep it buried and not talk about it because that's what usually leads to more and more deception, more and more manipulation and eventual betrayal. You, you don't want it to go there. So uh, back to this letter and back to my point of this segment, which is um, when you sense these trends and you feel like your thoughts about what's happening aren't being invalidated, aren't being closed in some way where you feel good, then keep those warning flags up and you might need to look for more. You might need to do some snooping. You didn't hear it from me. <laughs> and I, you can define snooping any way you want. Um, but okay, this is a very tricky area, like I said. Hopefully you already have honest communication and there is no need for suspicion. But um, if you have those suspicious feelings more often than not, then I do think you need to keep your eyes open. Now, on the flip side of that, where you have suspicions that come up, but they're invalidated and you feel good. And then every time you have a suspicion, it gets invalidated, not by what they say, because you believe everything they say, but by other things that confirm what they're saying is true. Like that example, like I was talking to my brother after work and and then you end up talking to the brother and the brother's like, yeah, we had a great conversation after his day was done at work. You can go, wow, that makes me feel good. That is the opposite. And that's what should happen when any suspicions come up. You should get clear invalidations of your possible false perceptions. I hope that makes sense <laughs> because I'm all about validating emotions. But if you have these uh, perceptions that come up or these beliefs, like I think this person might be betraying me. And then you say something like, that person was 15 minutes late. And then they tell you the reason they were late. And then you find out, oh, that reason was true. Those are the kind of invalidations that are good. And when you look at that kind of trend, that's the kind of trend that points at a healthier relationship, or at least the yellow flags don't have to come up. And if they were up, you can bring them back down. It's all about trends. It's all about looking at, um, I'm suspicious more often than not, and my suspicions are never completely eradicated. They're, they're still there. That's yellow flags leading to red flags. But if your suspicions are continually not justified and you feel good when each one just turns out to be uh, a figment of your imagination, then that's usually a better sign of a relationship that's going in the right direction. So you may still have like a uh, fear that someone could lie to you or, or deceive you or betray you in some way. But if you look at the trend, where, which way is it going? And that's a great way to help you come to a better place in you uh, about how you should feel. Because the worst thing is uh, the crazy making stuff where you suspect something and your suspicions aren't fully erased. They're still there. That's the worst because then you're living in this state of uh, stagnation. You're not sure which direction to go. You're not sure what to believe. And it doesn't get better. So if you're in that place, it might be time to take some further steps to figure out exactly if what you're thinking and feeling is true. And you might have to face some hard truths, unfortunately. So I want to thank John for writing that letter. And uh, I understand he, you know, he says he's in pain. At the end of the letter, he says, I'm lost. I'm not sure what to do. I'm all about when you sense this trend in you and your suspicions don't go away, that it's time to start uh, maybe believing in yourself and maybe believing that this could be true. Because you know what? Really the worst that could happen, let's just say that you believe it's true and you cannot uh, verify it or not. You might just have to honor yourself and get out of the situation. I know that might hurt. But would you rather live your life in constant suspicion of someone else? Or can you get to a place in yourself where you go, you know what, I don't know if they're deceptive or betraying or not, but I know that I'm making this relationship hard by being suspicious all the time. 
So I'm going to walk away. I'm going to get help. I'm going to do something that takes me out of complete focus on them and what they might be doing wrong. It's true. They could be doing something that is not healthy for the relationship and not supportive and nurturing of your happiness. And if you believe that's what's happening, then you need to honor yourself and do what you need for you. And that might mean walking away. But hopefully the the trend for you is that uh, when you get suspicious, it gets invalidated and then you feel better. And then that trend continues. That's what I want for you. I hope that's the truth for you. But if it's not, then um, don't think you're crazy. Just start following the trail and follow that trail of yellow flags and see where it leads. May not be the outcome you want, but at least you'll be a little farther along than just guessing all the time. So I'll end this segment on that up note. (laughs) Sorry, but that is something you need to do. If you've been tricked or betrayed in the past, especially, you do kind of have to keep your radar on uh, until the healing has taken place and you no longer have suspicions. When you don't have suspicions, you can live life and be happy and not have to worry because I don't think you should have to worry. I don't think you should have to go through life thinking about what what are they going to do? It's just, it takes up too much of your brain matter. <laughs> you don't want to spend all your time in your brain going, I wonder if, what if, what if, what if. So I fully believe once you have trust and you can establish trust and, the, and there's nothing going on that you really should be suspicious about, then just trust and enjoy the relationship and take it day by day and love each other as much as you can. I guarantee they're going to notice uh, the difference between you always in fear and suspicious mode and you paying them full attention and supporting and nurturing and loving them as much as you can. It's a tricky space to be in because if the person you're with has been deceptive in the past, uh, there's probably just an inkling of uh, your thoughts on that just every now and then. And that inkling is just your protection mechanism. It's your watchdog. So always know that your watchdog is always on. (laughs) <laughs> that way you can put your faith and trust and love into a relationship fully, knowing that your watchdog will come in and say, hey, there's a warning sign I want to give you. Oh, thanks for the warning sign. I'll look for the trend. If there's no trend I have to worry about, then I'm going to continue loving and, and being happy in this relationship. So that's what I have for you, John. Thank you for writing, and I, I do wish you the best. I hope everything's going well for you. And thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I'll be right back with some thank yous and some final thoughts right after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank a reviewer by the name of Zaba. (laughs) I have no idea if I'm saying that right, but uh, they left a review on Amazon for the book, The Overwhelmed Brain, Personal Growth for Critical Thinkers. And it is so nice to see these reviews starting to come in all positive. So that means that uh, the months I took writing and the three or four full edits (laughs) that it went through um, were really effective and uh, people are getting a lot from it. So Check out the Overwhelmed Brain book on Amazon or go to Barnes & Noble. They actually just released it on the Nook. And I think the Nook might be the least expensive place I've found it so far. Someone was asking me, how come I can't get it cheaper on the Kindle? And I was like, I don't know. Let me look. So I went to Amazon and I found out, well, you you can get it five cents cheaper. (laughs) And I was like, wait a minute. That's a, a digital copy of a physical book. Why is that around the same price? And I found out that um, all, all, at least the new books that I looked at, almost all new books I see come out, their Kindle prices are around the same as their physical copy. And uh, I believe it all has to do with paying every single middleman uh, between me and the uh, distributor, the publisher, the editors, the um, licensing. I don't know. There's all sorts of people involved and everyone uh, takes a cut. So they don't lower the price on some of these digital copies. But I did find the Nook version a lot cheaper. So that's going on now. So if you want to 
check it out. Go to barnesandnoble.com and, and if you have a Nook, uh, purchase that version while you can. I don't know if the price is going to go up or not, but uh, you can get it there and you can get it at Amazon. Anyway, if you leave a review for the book, even if it's terrible, <laughs> I hope not, but if it is, I'll still read your name on the air to thank you publicly. 120 countries listening right now. <laughs> I also want to thank Casper for sponsoring today's episode. If you want a Casper mattress for $50 off, go to casper.com forward slash brain and use the promo code brain to get that discount. And if you're in the U.S. or Canada, they're going to send it to you for free. You can sleep on it for 100 nights and then they'll pick it up if you don't like it. No risk. Definitely worth trying out. Casper.com forward slash brain. And I want to thank all the patron members. They are a big part of keeping this show alive. And I want to thank you if you've used the Amazon link on theoverwhelmedbrain.com. That's right. If you shop at Amazon, go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and click on that Amazon link before you shop. And that way uh, you don't pay anything more and Amazon sends us a few pennies for every dollar you spend. And it uh, helps the show. It keeps it going. And I love returning week after week to do this show for you. So check that out when you can. And finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. And I want to end the show talking about um, trust in relationships because uh, my girlfriend and I just had this conversation uh, maybe like a couple hours ago before I recorded this uh, segment. And that is on uh, how she had a lot of trouble trusting me when we first got into a relationship. And it wasn't because of me or my history. I mean, she really believed I did a lot of healing and I wasn't the same old manipulative, judgmental guy I used to be because I shared that with her. <laughs> I shared all that with her before we met. I said, you know, when I was in my marriage, I was this way. And wow, I didn't realize until the last year of my marriage how judgmental I was and uh, just how I didn't use the word evil. <laughs> but I look back and go, geez, I was just evil towards my wife. And I wasn't really evil. I was just um, trying to meet my needs in a way that was selfish and it wasn't healthy for her and it put her in a place where she felt like um, there was nothing she could do right and that was a bad thing for me to do. I mean I, I can say that about myself right? I was a bad <laughs> I was a bad person then or at least I uh, showed bad behavior and it was very selfish behavior and uh, I wanted things the way I wanted them and she wouldn't conform and that made her bad. And no, that was a problem in me. I wanted her to be a certain way and she couldn't be that certain way or didn't want to be. Basically, I wanted her to change. And after that relationship was over, I realized that I was putting a lot of pressure on her and I wasn't supporting her happiness. And that's the way I define love now. <laughs> I didn't define love back then the same way. But now I define love as when you support your partner's happiness, even if it doesn't benefit you. Now, that doesn't mean it goes to your detriment. It doesn't mean it makes you emotionally deficient or burns you out because you don't want to be that way. It means you really care about supporting what they want for themselves. And I tell you what, if they love you and they want to be with you, when you support what they want, you are supporting that they want to be with you. It's all part of the game. And if you can turn off your judgments and just accept your partner for who they are and where they are in life, they're going to love you even more. And I didn't learn that while I was in my marriage. It, it had to end before I really learned that lesson. And so when I met my current girlfriend, I, you know, I told her all this. I said, you know, I treated my wife like this. And she's like, you did? <laughs> you don't sound like someone who would do that. And I was like, yeah. I was, uh, and I had a lot of dysfunction that, that made me that way, and I certainly am not proud of it, but I am happy that um, she was able to get away from me. <laughs> I am happy that she was the one who initiated the initial separation, and that knocked me off my confident pedestal, where I was just so, I just felt so righteous and, and knew that she was the one who had to change in order for us to get better. It knocked me off of that pedestal and I realized, oh, I'm the one with the problem. And that's when my life started changing for the better. I mean, my life's been changing for many years, including in my marriage. But there were still a few things I needed to heal from in order to have and keep a healthy relationship. 
So, you know, my girlfriend and I were talking today about healthy relationships and especially trust. Because when I came into this relationship, I thought, hey, I'm healed. You should trust me. <laughs> and she's like, I don't trust you. <laughs> and this was like the first uh, year, year and a half in the relationship. And I'm like, wait, I've had a year <laughs> with you and you still don't trust me? And she said, not with everything. And I'm like, what? And I was really d actually disturbed. I was like, why? I mean, I haven't done anything to show you that I'm not trustworthy. And she goes, no, you're right. And I was like, well, then what's the deal? <laughs> I, I don't know if I can stay in a relationship where someone doesn't trust me. And she repeated what she told me a long time ago. She, you know, she says, it, it takes a long time for me. It takes a long time for me to build trust. And I, I never understood, you know, completely what that meant. I mean... Yes, she was sexually abused when she was a child. And, you know, certainly that plays a role. And I always give her leniency there. I always know that that is uh, something in there that certainly has shaped her decisions and her behavior. But there's a certain point where even me who knows this stuff gets to a point where, well, you know, I'm not that person. I'm not doing that to you. Why don't you trust me? So I had this little bit of insecurity come in, just a short period of time. <laughs> but we, you know, that gave us a chance to talk about it. And um, just today I realized what this whole idea of taking a long time to trust was about. And it has to do with um, her own belief about her own naivety in the world. Meaning there's a way that a lot of people work where they have these masks on. And I like to see it as a system of rules and boundaries that many people in the world have set up. Like going on a first date, you never show all your cards. You never show your true colors. Because if they saw the real you, are they still going to like you? You're trying to make the best first impression possible. And many people play by those rules, for lack of a better term. And because those rules exist, the people that don't play that game that aren't in that system of rules, the ones who might be a little bit more naive and innocent and aren't the type of person that could easily lie to someone else or deceive someone else, they could get duped very easily. There are people out there that are truly just innocents walking around and getting duped over and over again. I think this is what happens in manipulative relationships. You get with a manipulative person because you're naive. And, in a, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying that there's an innocence to that. There's a, a sweetness to that. But when you find the wrong person, especially over and over again, your level of trust in people and humanity goes way down. I mean, I can understand that now. It's like if you've been duped over and over again and you get into a great relationship and then six months later it's an abusive relationship... Of course, you're going to start building your own set of rules that say people are not trustworthy. People are bad. Certain people are good. Certain people are trustworthy. But in general, people are bad. I totally get that now. I didn't get that until today. And she understands that about herself. I think she came to a realization. Um, she may have known. I'm just maybe making this up. <laughs> but I think she, in, in my opinion, probably came to a realization today that wow, I, I have brought this level of naivety and innocence to a relationship thinking that the person's going to be this same good, honest person that they showed me on day one. And since that has not been her experience in life, when I came along, I am now under this rule set that applies to most people in her life. And so she's always waiting for the other shoe to drop, the tables to turn. And uh, they haven't. It's been two and a half years now and they haven't. And it's funny, every now and then she'll say to me, you know, I'm really glad I found you or something like that. She probably wouldn't admit that she says that. <laughs> but she says something like that, like, I'm glad we're together. And then she'll say something like, uh, you know, I'm, I've come to terms that this is a long term thing. I've come to terms that this is going to last and uh, you're an OK guy. <laughs> And it's, it's funny because I usually give my heart and um, full faith and trust right at the beginning of the relationship. And for her to wait, you know, a year, year and a half 
to do the same with me. It was very hard. You know, it wasn't impossible because right? I understood the abuse in her past and her some of them crappy relationships. And so I understood that. And um, that helped me be a lot more um, lenient, easygoing, forgiving when she said things like, no, I don't fully trust you yet. <laughs> and you know what? You might be in a relationship one day like that. If you are bringing this naive innocence into a relationship, hoping that the person you're with uh, doesn't dupe you. I don't know if you know the word dupe. I use the word dupe. You know, it doesn't um, scam you, you know. It doesn't turn into someone else that they aren't or that you thought that they weren't. If you're that type of person that can get duped easily, then uh, listen to this episode again because <laughs> there's the trend that I want you to look for, those yellow warning flags. And uh, you may need to start looking for something like that. Or maybe you'll just end up with a nice person who's not out to dupe you, who just wants a healthy, honest, loving relationship. They support your happiness. You support theirs. And everything feels good. And you can see each other for who they are and accept that about each other. And how do you do that? You know how to do that. You open your mind and step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve, not only yourself, but the relationship. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing.